We're going to look at Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 28. So get your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 28. We're going to be looking today at the road to Jerusalem as we're looking at the triumphal entry and really the beginning of the Easter Resurrection Week. We start here with Jesus at a triumphal entry. As he approached and saw this, oh, excuse me, sorry. When he saw, uh, when he had said these, these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached, approached Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter, you will find a colt there on which no other has sat, ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, Why are you trying it? Or untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent left and found it just as they had told them, as they were untying the colt. Its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the colt, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He said, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you this day would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For days will come when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Good God, we pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray that as we go into this time of the service, that we, we be guided by you today and by your word to see your truth and to understand your truth. So please help us to open our eyes today. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As I said earlier to begin the sermon, this is the beginning of the resurrection week. This is the beginning of Jesus coming into Jerusalem to pay the price for our sins. And as we look at the triumphal entry, as we look at what we often call Palm Sunday, I want us to take a look today at the individuals around. I want us to take a look at the four groups of people that were involved in this situation and see where their focus was. How did everyone view this account? For I want to tell you up front, how we perceive a situation will determine how we react to it. Our perception is not always reality, as we're going to look here. There's actually four different perceptions of the event, but only one is accurate. How you view something, how you're looking at something, how your focus go, will determine your reaction. So let's take a quick, quick look at it. Let's start with Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to have the right reaction to this event. He's going to view it in a proper light. So let's take a look at how he viewed it. Jesus view begins with his upcoming death. Jesus knew that he was going to die for our sins. He knew what he was heading into Jerusalem to do. I want us to take a look at that, so if you would just go back into Matthew chapter 20. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, start with verse 17, we will see where Jesus knows what is going to happen. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the twelve uh, disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and on the third day be raised. He knew what was coming. Jesus knew how he was going to approach this. Jesus knew how the city was going to react to him. You see, you know, we're in, we're in March Madness now, and everybody's trying to figure out the brackets, and you're going to base upon your best guess possible. 
Jesus wasn't guessing. He wasn't thinking this was the reaction. He knew it. But he wasn't just viewing it on his upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. That was his first focus. But he actually had a second way of looking at this and how he concludes the passage we read this morning. He also viewed the, uh, this event in the light of their rejection. In other words, Jesus knew that when he was coming into this town, even though they were saying, Hosanna, even though they were saying, bless this one who's coming in the name of the Lord, even though they were laying down their coats and their palm branches, even though they were doing all these things, he knew ultimately that they were going to reject him. He knew that they were going to crucify him. And he knew the punishment that was coming. He knew that there was going to be a punishment, which if you look at Jerusalem in 70 AD and their destruction, that's when it came. And somebody might say, why was God doing this? Well, let's look at this. First of all, the first gospel message was preached in Jerusalem and they ignored it. They had 40 years, nearly 40 years, of the church being inside Jerusalem with all of the most important apostles and, and leaders being there to proclaim the message. They had 40 years to repent of their sins. That is an entire generation. They did not do it. For the rejection, for their act of killing God's Son, for rejecting all that the law and the prophets had proclaimed to them, for rejecting God's plan for them, they faced a judgment. Jesus knew this was coming. This is why he's weeping over the land. God does not delight in our punishment. It hurts him every bit as it does for a parent to punish their, their child. Jesus' view of this event 2,000 years ago remained in the light of salvation. This was the key of viewing this event properly. It was what he was coming to do. It was what he was trying to save them from. And it was also in light of the rejection of the one and only perfect son of the living God. The reason he had the right focus of everything in this event is because he focused everything into the plan of God. But this is sadly not where everybody else went, including his very own disciples. The disciples should have known better, but they didn't, so what happened? What was the disciples' view of this? First of all, the disciples did not believe the testimony, or believe Jesus' testimony about his death. Jesus told them what he was going to do, and they never accepted it. People sometimes say, but God told me something I would believe in. The testimony in the scripture is if you want to have a hard heart, if you want to reject God, you're going to. And his disciples did not listen to Jesus. They actually argued with Jesus about the plan of God. In Matthew chapter 16, start with verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes to be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you were not thinking about God's concerns but about human concerns. As we're looking at this passage now, understand that Peter was very hard-headed about what Jesus claimed he was coming to do. Because in their view, in their mindset, the Messiah was never going to die. <coughs> Bad theology blinds us to the truth, even the truth that Jesus himself is telling us. Peter was so hard-headed that even on the night that he was betrayed, as everything was unfolding, just as Jesus says, he pulled out his sword and cut some guy's ear off. The disciples didn't understand it because they didn't believe Jesus. The disciples were also viewing this in the, the, the mentality that the Messiah was coming to set an earthly kingdom up and rule and that they would have a place in this kingdom. Therefore, they were still also thinking about their rank, where they fit into the kingdom. 
Look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. This is on the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, the night before his crucifixion, and this was their discussion. Starting with verse 24. Then a dispute also arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. It is not to be like them among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you shall also become like the youngest. Whoever leads like the one servant. For who is greater, the one that is at the table or the one serving? Is it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. As you're going down this, this, this road with Jesus, as he is coming down and the people are praising him, and the disciples' minds, in the back of their minds, says, this is it, boys. This is where he's going to become king. This is where he's going to take on his messiahship. This is where we're going to be with him as he rules the world. They missed the point that he wasn't coming to rule the world, but to save the world. They missed the point that, the, that God was not setting up an earthly kingdom. He was setting up a heavenly one. And that they were to have a role in the heavenly kingdom. And the whole way of looking at this, they had a worldly view of the event. And therefore, missed it completely. The disciples missed the meaning by having the wrong focus. But they weren't the only ones. There was religious leaders there that day. We read about the Pharisees who told Jesus to tell the people to quit crying out to him, to silence his disciples. Why were they in this mentality? Let's take a look at the Pharisees. The Jewish religious leaders viewed Jesus as a threat and determined to kill him. John chapter 11, start with verse 45. There were many of the Jews who came to Mary, and so what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convinced, uh, convinced the Sanhedrin and were saying, What are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the uh, Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You're not considering that it is to your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. Jesus therefore never walked openly among the Jewish, uh, the Jews, but departed from them to the countryside near a wilderness to call to the town of Ephraim, and he stayed there with the disciples. Now the Jewish Passover was near, and he went up to Jerusalem from the country to purify themselves before the Passover. They were looking for Jesus and asked one another as they said, stood in the temple, What do you think? He won't come to the festival, will he? The chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it to them so they could arrest him. The plot was determined. And coming down that day and hearing how the crowds were going to Jesus just so split, so uh, uh, just solidified them. You see, the religious leaders were now worried about the attention that Jesus was getting. In this passage we see here with John, specifically they're worried that Rome is going to come and take their place. As they're looking at this, they're jealous that this, this untrained rabbi, this carpenter turned rabbi, was getting more attention than they, the leaders, the, the scholars of the day. They were worried that somebody was going to come and take their place. They didn't view this as, what does the scripture say? They didn't view this as, what did the 
Bible actually say? They viewed it in the light of themselves. And we have too many people today that are viewing things by, uh, by how it affects them. They're not viewing religion as what the Bible says. They're viewing religion as what do I want. Whenever you have this what do I want mentality, you will live in misery because you will never get what you want. Ever. They missed the importance of the events that day because of their worldly thinking. There was one other group here that we cannot neglect. This group's a little bit harder to read, but it was the people that day. I want you to understand, as we're coming into this text, that the expectation for the Messiah was extremely high. It had been high for several years. In fact, during the ministry of John the Baptist, which takes place about three years prior to this, caused people to start to wonder, is he the Messiah? Now, if you look there in John chapter 1, starting with verse 19, the Apostle John, who was actually a disciple of John the Baptist, writes about this. Who knows, he may even have been right there when this happened. This was a testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He didn't deny it, but confessed, I'm not the Messiah. What then, they asked, Are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. Can you tell us about yourself? He says, I am the voice of one crying out for wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah prophesied, uh, just as Isaiah the prophet said. So stop here, we see that the, the expectation among the people were high. They did not like Roman rule. They did not like the fact that they didn't have their own independence. They didn't like what was happening in their own religion. There were so many things that people were ready and hoping that a Messiah would come and start to change things. So 2,000 years ago today, they cheered for him. They, they exalted praise for him. They confessed him. Then Friday they were crucified. He didn't turn out to be exactly what they were expecting. In faith, you're either going to be made in the image of God or you're going to try to make God into your image. When you have preconceived ideas and you will not let the word of God dwell within you, you're going to believe what the crowds believe. And the crowds are the absolute most dangerous group to follow because they're not thinking. They're not examining for themselves. They're simply doing what everybody else is doing. It's sort of like, you remember when your, your mom or dad used to ask you if your friends jumped off the bridge, would you do it too? That's what crowd mentality actually does. As Christians, we have to focus on what the actual Word says and view it. They thought they were reading this event in one light, but they were completely missing the point. So as we look through the text today, we notice that there were four different people, four different groups of people that saw the same event, but only one had the right interpretation. Jesus knew it was about salvation. The disciples believed it was about an earthly kingdom. The Pharisees believed it was about losing their prominent place. The crowd believed it was about overthrowing Rome. But only Jesus had it right. Your focus will determine how you are viewing the scriptures, and it will determine how you're viewing the world. I want you to understand that how sometimes you see things is not actually the way it's actually happening. Sometimes you just need to change your focus. You need to change the, your attitude. Sometimes you just got to change 
your mentality in order to see the truth. The problem we're having in today's world. Nobody wants to change themselves. They want to change the world around them to fit themselves. That will never happen. Christians, we understand that the majority of the world is going to reject the message of the scriptures because they're looking at it wrong. Today, I challenge you and implore you to take a look at this account today and see how people miss something and to develop the mature, right attitude so that you don't miss the point. Where is your focus today? See, a lot of people have a lot of focuses. It may be on what's for dinner afterwards. It may be what they're going to do today. It may be on their week coming up. It may be on their family. It may be on their job. Today's the Lord's Day, which means our focus is supposed to be on God. Our focus is supposed to be on God every day, but today, of all days, it should be. Where is your focus right now? And are you following God down the path he's called you to live? Every Sunday we give an opportunity for anybody who wants to make that decision for the Lord. To, be, to repent of your sins, to be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, and to get the Holy Spirit. Whether it be to that you've already done that, you just need to turn your life back around. Whatever your decision may be today. We just encourage you to make that decision as we stand and sing our invitational song.